Hello everyone, today we'll be doing the analysis of uh, sociology uh, 2023 UPSC question paper one. So um, let's see how uh, the paper was. And uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, dynamic aspect that was added to this, uh, this question paper. So uh, I have arranged the questions in uh, slide forms and uh, we will we'll be doing the analysis accordingly. Okay, so the first question that was there was about uh, the distinctiveness of the feminist method of uh, social research. Now, uh, the question is uh, talking about and asking you about uh, what are the distinct or uh, the change in uh, the method or the analysis of uh, or the method or the analysis in the social research right. just a second okay so the question is uh, saying that the, what is the distinctiveness of the feminist method of social research. That means uh, the distinct quality in a feminist method while doing the social research. So what you can do here is, and the question is saying that you need to comment over this. So what you can do is that uh, you can first talk about what is the social research and uh, how or uh, what is the distinctive quality of a feminist method uh, while doing uh, the social research. So if you see um, what is uh, feminist or what is feminism, so um, in this what you can write about is that uh, the analysis or the research is basically dealing with what method in a social research so it becomes what more of a gender centered perspective and uh, when you are talking about this gender centered uh, perspective you can also talk about what how um, bell hooks have talked about it for example, uh, the gender specific roles. You can also talk about the change in power dynamics. Uh, one thing that you got is a gender spent uh, gender centered perspective you can also talk about what um there is inter sectionality and how is this intersectionality coming here you can talk about hill collins and what is that for example, uh, Hill Collins has talked about uh, the change or the role of class, sexuality, etc. while dealing with the work. Um, other thing what you can write about uh, or write about here is you can also talk about what you can also talk about the qualitative research method for example qualitative 
search meter now here you can give you can talk about dorothy smith's work and uh, what you can talk about here is that see when a feminist is doing a social research what will uh, that person do so somewhere other a biasness will be there so dorothy smiths have talked about what biasness in the search value fine now these are uh, some of uh, the distinctive this method or some kind of distinctiveness that is lying in uh, a feminist method of sociological research now what else you can do is you can add on many more perspective for example you can talk about advocacy and what is that you can talk about martin's work over here now what is uh, martin's work talking about here you can talk about you know challenges of inequality um for example uh, for long women have been suppressed a lot so why you are doing a sociological research and uh, you are talking about uh, you know um, or you you are doing a research through feminist perspective so advocacy is one such thing that martin uh, or martin has talked about so what has she talked about she has said that uh, there is uh, findings that uh, has said that when this kind of ritual research is there so more often now and then you are also dealing with or you will also talk about the inequality the person is facing why performing social research uh the next question is that discuss the relationship between sociology and political science now what you can do here is you can talk about uh, what sociology is and what political science is separately and uh, since they are talking about or the question is about uh, relationship so you will talk about what are the similarities uh, you are going to see in this uh, or you are going to see between the two subjects that is sociology and political uh, science so one such is that uh, see when you are studying society what you are studying is you are talking about society from the perspective of what social structure norms interaction so you can talk about social structure you can talk about norms you can talk about perspectives fine now when it comes to political science what you can do is that you can talk about the political system you can talk about political institutions and when you are talking about these political uh, system political institutions you should also focus on what how they are working in an organization or you can also talk about their functioning etc right uh, other than that what you can talk about is you can also talk about the power and authority for example uh, when it when it is in the form of sociology uh, you can talk about the power and dynamics of the social groups and when it talks about political science then definitely you have to talk about the government and political institutions now uh, more specifically if you 
go with uh, what social institutions are. So here uh, you can talk about family, education, kinship system, etc. So here you can talk about social institutions that is family, kinship, religion, education, etc. And when it comes to uh, this political system, what is going to happen? Now here we will be talking about government, legislature, political parties. Fine. Um, what else? See, uh, there are a lot of factors that you can add on over here. You can uh, talk about uh, the common areas, for example, how the political behavior is going to influence the social movements. You can also talk about how the political behavior is going to bring in social organizations. So everything would be uh, written over here, for example. How your political behavior is going to influence social prospects, social organizations, Now, moving on to the next question, the next question says, how does the dramaturgical um, perspective enable our understanding of everyday life? Now, uh, in order to write this question, what you need to know is that what is dramaturgical perspective? So here, uh, this dramaturgical perspective was given by uh, Kaufman. So you have to uh, you know, be aware of this thing that the dramaturgical perspective was uh, introduced by Irving Goffman. And uh, why did he introduce this? So he uh, introduced this perspective to understand everyday life. And uh, how will you understand everyday life? You know, um, they uh, or this uh, government were, was trying to understand everyday life through theatrical or theatrical framework. That means through theatre perspective. So what will this give? This will actually help you to understand what your uh, social interaction, interaction with the community, with the people and more so what is going to happen is that you are also going to present yourself. That means you are able to comprehend yourself more uh, nicely. That means you can, um, you know, access your human behavior. You can also talk about your, or you can also understand your perspective regarding everyday life, really like each day of your life, so everyday life. Now, if I talk about how this is going to happen, so see, uh, you hear, uh, there are a lot of things that you can talk about, for example, um, when this is drama, when this drama, that dramaturgical perspective is going to be there, you can uh, you know talk about uh, how your impression, your expression management, uh, your emotional management, how you are uh, presenting yourself uh, while uh, being there in the front stage, and uh, how things are working out while uh, you are at backstage. 
So each and everything could be evaluated over here. Fine. So we can talk about um, how Impression management is there. That means uh, how people uh, present themselves. And present themselves where? Mm -hmm. Or what is their public identity? Okay, so you can talk about that. You can also uh, bring out to Goffman's work. How Goffman's work is helpful for symbolic interactionism. And symbolic interactionism means, that means how you are going to interact or what is the importance of symbols, language, and eventually how they are going to bring over human interaction. And all this, uh, all this interaction work, all this dramatical perspective, is going to bring in what social order because ultimately you are writing the paper of sociology so you should know how this is going to uh, bring in social order in the society because if uh, this is not uh, covering the social aspect uh, what is the point writing it in sociology Fine. Uh, so this was about dramaturgical perspective. You can also talk about uh, how many sociologists are critique to this work. For example, uh, uh, they are not influenced by the uh, Goffman's work. So they are, they are, you know, you, they are talking about uh, the psychiatric hospitals. Now they are saying, uh, talking about prisons, how people uh, use their uh, behavior to manipulate. So. Um, all that could be covered over here in the critical aspect, so if you want, right? Uh, next is, is reference group truly a universally applicable model? So what you can talk about here is you can talk about what reference group is and who has introduced this concept of uh, reference group by uh, sociologists. So here you can talk about Herbert Heinen. Now, when you're talking about Herbert Hyman, you can also talk about uh, when did he introduce it, so mid of 20th century. And um, uh, why he introduced this reference group, what was the need? So the need was that uh, in order to understand what individuals behavior and attitude and uh, for what to compare themselves because uh, what is a reference group it's, it's a kind of a group that you are referring while you are comparing and uh, you are this kind of comparison is with respect to what it is uh, specific to cultural, social, and psychological factors. So, um, why uh, you are comparing um, with respect to anything, like anything, what uh, roles are going to come onto this? Uh, it will uh, attribute to a lot many factors. It would be your cultural factors also, your social factors also, 
factor, psychological factors also because uh, based on these factors, firstly you are going to select a group, a reference group, and then you are uh, going to compare. So with that respect, how you uh, see, uh, it will uh, vary from person to person. A reference group that I am referring to uh, have my own psychic code. Uh, that depends upon the other person that changes with person to person because uh, obviously for uh, psychic reason only so one reason is this now what is the uh, un universally uh, okay so the next part of the question is talking about that is reference group theory a universally applicable model so is it uh, you know you universally applicable so yes uh, you can talk about uh, how it is applicable for example uh, when you are talking about a reference group you are taking into reference family friends colleagues communities so that is one reason um, you also talk about what self-esteem social identity let's talk about Social identity. Just a minute. Just a second. Okay, so I was talking about social identity. So the development. Where is your social identity coming from, or where uh, is your the self-esteem portion, or the concept of self coming from? It is coming the, uh, from this aspect of reference group because uh, when you uh, you know you you are looking to someone or you are looking to something. Then there is a construct of self-esteem, self-concept. It also talks about identities. Right? Um, you can uh, also say that uh, in some cases we are also talking about what we are uh, not only comparing with respect to social construct but we are also comparing with respect to socio-economic factors and what are those socio-economic uh, factors for example you are talking about uh, uh, say income inequalities <coughs> So individuals at uh, most of the time you will find that they are comparing themselves with respect to the social economic conditions. Um, then uh, is it uh, applicable? So the question is saying that uh, you, know, you have to uh, point out the is it universally applicable. So uh, uh, in some cases you can also say that it is acting as a source of uh, motivation. Because you compare and uh, that, uh, you know, pushes you to work harder. So there is a behavioral change that is accepted. So when behavior change is there, then your preferences change. So when your preferences changes, you know, there is altogether a shift in your personality. So this was about your reference group. Now uh, the next question is: Do you think that the boundary line between ethnicity and race is blurred? So uh, now they have talked about justifying your answer. So what you can uh, do here is um, you can uh, talk about how your uh, role of ethnicity and uh, race is influenced by many factors. That is your culture your identity, your historical developments.
Fine. And how uh, this is, uh, or do you think that the boundary line between the ethnicity and race is blurred? So you can talk about uh, various cultural variations. You can also talk about, for example, like cultural variations. And what I want to say is, Uh, see, what happens is that when it comes to, you know, race, so a person can say that I am African-American. I am an African-American. This uh, person would say by race. Okay. And uh, when it uh, comes to uh, culture part, so the person again would say that I am an African-American culture. So this would act as ethnicity part. Now, uh, what is happening to you know ethnicity, or how there is a you know change in ethnicity over time? So what you can talk about here is that you can say uh, ethnicity is evolving with time. How is this possible? See, uh, with time, what is happening is ethnicity is transforming. And when it is transforming, it is uh, blending. Blending with respect to what? Your ethnicity and your race. This is getting blended and when this is getting blended what is happening the uh, boundary is getting diminished Why? Because uh, you can say how globalization is bringing in what hybrid identities. And these hybrid identities you can, uh, you know, talk about uh, both racial and ethnic forms. next question. The next question is saying that uh, you have to talk about Robert Mitchell's Iron Law of Oligarchy. Uh, then you have to also talk about the uh, difference between what Merito's uh, theory of uh, lion and foxes. Now uh, this has been a very important question and uh, this theory has been also very important. So you first need to talk about Robert Mitchell's Iron Law of Oligarchy. Then you have to talk about uh, the difference with respect to the very ghost. <coughs> So, when there is iron law of oligarchy, what is there? Um, now, this iron law of oligarchy, um, you can talk about that uh, Michel has uh, given this uh, theory or this concept in his work of political parties, 1911. Now, uh, when uh, Michel has talked about this iron law of oligarchy, what was uh, he referring to or uh, what was he trying to say? 
So what he was trying to say is that whether it is a political party or you say it's a labor union or it's any, uh, for that matter, any democratic structure is there. What is happening is there is a small elite leadership group. Uh, for that matter, what is if there is any political party, labor union, or uh, any democratic group. there so what will happen is there is a um always a small leadership group which will emerge and when it will emerge it will do what it will consolidate power over time so what is going to happen it will with time it is going to consolidate power now uh, if you go with the cycle what is uh, uh, robert say um, robert is saying that whenever there is emergence of any political party or any democratic group there are very high chances that a small group is going to emerge and this small group uh, will consolidate power over time so this small group small leadership group is referred as what? Now um, you can uh, see uh, what according to you is uh, Robert Mitchell's Iron Law of Oligarchy. So this is uh, what is uh, about uh, Iron Law of Oligarchy. Now here uh, you can also talk about that uh, why or uh, you know why what is the reason behind emergence of this small leadership group. So you can talk about specialization, you can talk about efficiency. Uh, see efficiency means that uh, large organizations require efficient decision makers. Okay, so what is going to happen is then uh, you are going to uh, transform your organization into small uh, small groups. So, what is the reason behind this? The reason behind being that uh, you know there could be efficient decision making, uh, quick decision making, correct decision making. Then uh, specialization is there. Then it becomes uh, much more easier. Why? Because uh, now what is going to happen is that specialized roles and expertise are needed. So this will lead to what? Concentration of power. See, if a person uh, is uh, specialized, uh, you know, in uh, reading uh, the economy of the country in any of the political group or uh, setup, so what is going to happen? The concentration of power and it is all the decision making regarding uh, or respect to the economic factor is going in the hands of that person. So concentration of power based on specialization. <clears throat> now the next thing is that um, once uh, if any individual uh, you know gets the leadership role, what is going to happen? Uh, that they are going to do what? They are going to challenge the authority. So questioning of authority becomes very important. And for that matter, what is it? This oligarchy becomes very, very important. Why? Because uh, they are going to do what question the authority and uh, which is important for decision making. Fine. Uh, the next thing that they are saying that uh, you need to talk about what uh, Pareto's theory and Pareto's theory of what lion and foxes. So first you need to talk about uh, who Pareto was. So he was an Italian sociologist and economist. And then you can uh, talk about his theory of the 
release and circulation of fluids. Now, when uh, you are talking about uh, the theory of Pareto about release and circulation of fluids. Uh, there you will uh, talk about the concept of what lies that boxes. Now again, the thing is that uh, what are lying in boxes? Now uh, lines. First, we go with lines. So, what is this? Now, lines uh, are referred to the individuals or elites who attain and maintain power through force, coercion, or military sense. So, people or leaders or elites. Maintaining power through. or right uh, next thing they said about uh, foxes uh, the speed the circulation of the theory so uh, lions and foxes. So you, I told you about lions. Now next is foxes. So who are foxes? Now foxes are uh, someone who are referred as very cunning, and uh, they have the power of manipulation. So what uh, or uh, you know how how the importance of foxes is there? So what do they do is that uh, they are very skillful, skillful with respect to. They navigate the social and political network. And they do it how? Through intelligence. And uh, then you can say that ma'am, lions are also that uh, intelligent. So lions are intelligent, uh, but what is happening is that they are using more of their physical strength or their you know military strength, gold, etc. Uh, but when it comes to foxes, they use their manipulation power much more than uh, their physical strength. So here, what you find is that uh, they use uh, manipulation or skillful or cunningness in order to influence the. Now, uh, the third part of the question is saying that you have to substantiate them. So, uh, how uh, the sociologists have substantiated it? Now, Pareto's concept or Pareto's concept of lion and foxes uh, are primarily descriptive. So, what is the sociologist uh, often use these uh, you know, these concepts of lions and fox um, to analyze what the power dynamics. So, power dynamics, the lead behavior, etc. Now, uh, uh, first is this. Now, second, what you can talk about is that uh, when uh, historically, what uh, we have seen is that uh, initially, when people who were uh, you know powerful, what what were what were they doing with it, or how they used to use the power? So, um, in case of lion, that means uh, those people uh, who had you know a lot of uh, strength, physical strength. So they use that power with respect to the force. That means uh, force and coercion. And uh, when it came to foxes, uh, 
during historical times, they did what? They relied only on the Uh, you can also talk about now what you can talk about is that uh, how you know sociologists have used this concept on line and boxes to uh, talk about the political For example, what you can do is here you can talk about or give the examples of Napoleon. And that Napoleon was kind of lying. Fine. Then uh, behavior analysis, if you want to get focus on over there also, that uh, how the behavior of lines is uh, you know uh, they possess a leadership style uh, they have uh, qualities with respect to what lead behavior and then at the same time with respect to foxes you can talk about what now they depend upon um, situations Fox are who depend upon situation for manipulation. Fine. So this was with uh, respect to Michel's Isle of Oligarchy and Pareto's theory uh, with respect to lions and foxes. Now let's move on to the next one and the next one is what? Uh, the next question is what is historical materialism? Now this is a very um, static one. Explain, uh, examine its relevance in understanding of contemporary society. So historical materialism here uh, you will talk about how this concept came from the Marxist theory. <coughs> Then uh, you can also talk about the significance of the word that means uh, firstly understanding the historical and social development. And uh, this is with respect to what Marxist principles. Um, <coughs> now they say that you need to examine its relevance with respect to contemporary society. So you also know that uh, you know how the contemporary society of today is working. So there is more often now and then you are having a class struggle. So the contemporary society is facing class struggle, there is transitions, there are revolutions. So you can you know talk about each and everything. Uh, first you can uh, give the detailing of class struggle. Here you can talk about what bourgeois, uh, you can talk about proletariats and uh, here you can also give the relevance of economic interest uh, then you can talk about the, the development development of what uh, modes of development for example uh, Karl Marx has talked about the means of production, relations of production. So all this means of production, or oh, sorry, forces of production, relations of production. So forces of production. You can talk about the relation of the forces of production. So 
what is happening is that uh, when you are talking about this, you can give the importance of what? Relevance of wage, wages of the labor. You can talk about uh, feudalism that was present initially during the agrarian production. <clears throat> Then uh, you can also talk about revolution and this revolution is with respect to what? Now this revolution might also bring in what social upheaval. And this social upheaval is going to change the shift in balance of power. Then you can also talk about all the superstructure that are based on economy. And what are those superstructure? For example, uh, you can talk about uh, all those uh, construction of, uh, you know, legal system, cultural system, ideological aspects of the society, everything, everything could be uh, talked about. That means the economic structure is the block above which all other superstructure are being created. See, uh, whatever I'm telling you, I'm telling you with respect to the understanding of the question. Uh, and uh, what kind of content can we frame? So uh, you can talk about all this. Now the next question is what are variables and how do they facilitate research? So what you need to do over here is that you should define firstly uh, what variables are. So firstly define variables and uh, what are variables for that matter? Now, in, with respect to variables, you can talk about uh, uh, that in context of sociological research, what is uh, what kind of characteristics variable uh, have. So, uh, if you are having a variable that could be used to you know, study, observe, measure, manipulate. what uh, to understand social phenomena and uh, how do these uh, variables uh, you know play a big role in facilitating research because this is what the question is demanding that uh, you have to tell the relevance of variable with respect to sociological research. So you can talk about that this is going to bring the clarity to your research. And how will this bring the clarity to your research? Because uh, there will be, you know, when there's a question or when there is a hypothesis <laughs> that need to be studied everything or every research requires what precision so very well provide that precision now other than that you can also talk about data collection how because uh, if uh, you are collecting data for example for any of your surveys or for that matter your interview observation etc what is going to happen is that uh, these survey and uh, data all kind of your data collection is influenced by what the nature of variable so all these methods will only work out if you know the nature of variables. Hmm. 
then you have hypothesis and uh, how is this hypothesis coming now when you are you know uh, going to formulate a hypothesis for that for that matter any researcher is going to formulate a hypothesis what is happening is that uh, they are collecting data now when they are collecting data so all your hypothesis is coming from uh, prediction you are making prediction and this prediction will uh, probably give you a hypothesis and for making this prediction what is acting as a central part your variable is acting as a then you can talk about the statistical analysis and this statistical analysis is going to give you what now uh, this statistical analysis is going to bring in conclusions comparisons and uh, they are important with respect to what i think <coughs> generalization of data you can also talk about quantification of data so uh, everything for example you can also talk about quantification of data this also requires uh, variables and measurements also require variables right other than that um, you can uh, also talk about theory development now uh, that is again a big thing so theory development now the theory development is also with respect to what uh this is through the patterns that uh, you or that a researcher for that matter or any person is going to visualize from a social point point now let's move on to the next question the next question talks about what are the characteristics of a scientific method <coughs> do you think that scientific method in conducting social research is full proof now uh, first explain what is scientific method so you can say that scientific method is uh, you know kind of a systematic approach for what to inquire and investigate fine uh, you can also say that uh, this scientific method is a powerful tool and this powerful tool is with respect to you know <coughs> powerful tool with respect to uh, any kind of research that can take place why because uh, this puts on elaboration yani this elaborates any research at the same time this puts on limitation works right the question says do you think that scientific method in conducting sociological research is full proof so firstly what you can do is that uh, you will tell about the characteristic so uh, characteristics my first thing is your observation uh, second is your inquiry fine uh, you can also talk about uh, hypothesis testing why because scientific method helps you to design experiments it helps you to design studies it uh, brings in objectivity it brings in uh, unbiasedness fine um, then uh, you can also talk about empirical evidence to 
palladium oil etc now uh, they are saying that is it full proof so uh, no uh, not all the time you can say that it is full proof why because uh, there are a lot of ethical constraints why any kind of research is taking place then uh, there is a complex social phenomena also fine other than that you can also talk about uh, subjectivity why is subjectivity there because uh, there is a lot of uh, data that is being interpreted in a different manner so interpretation of data differently uh, then uh, you also don't know about the sensitivity so that plays a big role then uh, how are you going to bring in what value neutrality because this is very important so not all the time we can say that there are a lot of uh, constraint also the value neutrality is also there by all this you can add on uh, the next question is how do you assess the changing pattern in kinship relation in the society now this is a, again static portion uh, here you can uh, talk about uh, uh, the marriage patterns uh, how you know how family how marriage and family life is changing right uh, here you can give the Theory of Kuntz, his work on the way we were, uh, the way we we never were, or marriage and history. So, uh, Stephen Kuntz's work on marriage and history. So you can talk about this. Then you can also talk about Hansen's one. now if you talk about hansen you can also tell them about uh, uh, the work or the complexities uh, with respect to the working class fine uh, then uh, you can also talk about uh, david shinnels so david shinnels <clears throat> now this is a divisional work with respect to emphasizing the cultural specificity with respect to kinship system fine uh, you can also talk about ronald bird you can give uh, the analysis of the ronald bird and uh, his understanding about kinship relations and uh, when you are talking about his understanding about kinship relation he talks about uh, you know the individuals opportunities that are coming on their way the outcomes etc individuals Right. Uh, now, all this uh, is how you can access the pattern of uh, changing kinship. So, changing kinship pattern. Now, next question is: Weber's idea of bureaucracy, a product of historical uh, experiences of Europe. So, what you can talk about is firstly, what is the Weber's idea of bureaucracy? then uh, what is the historical experiences of uh, europe so here you can talk about that you know when industrialization was there when uh, modernization was there so how uh, these uh, these changing uh, patterns of the society required what 
they required this uh, <clears throat> administration role. Right. So you can talk about uh, Weber's observation with respect to this. Uh, first, industrialization, modernization. You can also talk about the rise of a nation state concept. And this nation state concept is uh, going to bring in what effective governance? So, in order to bring effective governance, what is going to happen? You have to talk about the Weber's idea of bureaucracy. Then, at the same time, um, you can also talk about uh, how the German system was very, uh, you know, well organized. Uh, there was this German Empire. So, German Empire was very having a very well organized bureaucracy. So, you can talk about this. Uh, other than that, you can also give uh, the theory of uh, very important theory of Protestant ethics and spirit of capitalism. So, how the Protestants work ethic resonated with discipline in uh, heritage of bureaucratic organization. So, Protestant ethics, uh, yeah, Protestant ethics. resonated with work of bureaucratic organization. Fine. Uh, then uh, you can also talk about uh, the legal rational authority. Unit 4, Weber Wala. So legal rational authority. Weber's classification of authority into three types. And what was that? This was the one was your legal rational authority, right? Uh, which reflects what the legal system and rule of law in Europe. Fine. The next one is do you think that common sense is the starting point of social research? What are its advantages and uh, limitations? So uh, again, very static. Uh, first, you need to talk about common sense. Then they are uh, talking about what are uh, its advantages of, uh, or what are the advantages of common sense in social research. So uh, you can also say that uh, the person is very accessible, accessible with respect to what uh, from everyday life. So everyday life makes the person accessible. Uh, to certain um, specialized sources. Fine. Uh, then you can also talk about familiarity. Familiarity with respect to what? Um, the person becomes familiar with the social life. And uh, this happens through observation. So, observation with respect to social life. Uh, then you can also talk about what intuitive or understanding. That means uh, intuition comes on to play. And how does this happen? Because uh, the person is having a certain knowledge with respect to social phenomena. Fine. Uh, other than that, you can, uh, now when they are saying that you have to write about the advantages, okay, then comes your next factor, which is your limitations with respect to common sense in social research. So you can talk about there is a lot of subjectivity because, again, I talked about intuition, so subjectivity was the other. Uh, then you can uh, say that there is a lot of assumptions and generalization there. So assumption is then assumption. So all this is acting as a limitation part. The next part uh, you can uh, talk about that there is inadequate explanation. You can also talk about the inconsistency. 
right uh the next thing you can also talk about the uh, there is no consultation about anything so there uh, is a lot of um, rigor rigor with respect to what that means there is uh, a lot of uh, inaccuracy there is a lot of stereotypes so inaccuracy stereotypes uh then uh, there's a very limited scope also you can also write that because uh, when it comes to you know um common sense what is going to happen uh, avenues left unexplored so limited scope and here you can add on you know all multiple number of sociologists but this is how you have to attend sociologists you can add on fine now uh, how is uh, poverty a form of social exclusion illustrate in this connection the different dimension of poverty and social exclusion so what you can do is that first you need to define what social exclusion is then uh, with respect to poverty uh, what are different dimensions here you can uh, bring in a lot of uh, angles for example if you want to bring in the economic dimension you can uh, study about amartya sen when you are talking about amartya sen you are talking about what uh, capability deprivation now what he did was that he argued that poverty not only involves low income but also inability to access uh, basic capabilities and what are those uh, capability deprivation for example your education your education your uh, inadequate nutrition your health care etc so all these are uh, basic or the uh, basic things basic capabilities are not there then you can talk about uh, social dimension you can talk about uh, peter townsend you can talk about amartya sen you can talk about uh, peter townsend and uh, here what you can write about is that uh, understanding of poverty beyond the income levels that means uh, uh, lack of social participation by lack of social social participation you can also talk about social isolation by uh, other than that you can also talk about uh, julius wilson now what was the thoughts of uh, julius uh, wilson now julius wilson um, have argued about concentration of poverty in disadvantaged neighborhood for example if there is you know lack of access to quality education job opportunities etc so this uh, has uh, tried to highlight how structural factors contribute towards poverty and social uh, exclusion similar to the capability deprivation factor so they uh, julius wilson were of the opinion of structural factors contributing to poverty right um uh, one very important is the oscar lewis so oscar lewis culture of poverty uh, talk about oscar lewis culture of poverty Fine. Uh, here you can also talk about Wallstones theory. That is uh, global inequalities. So Wallstones theory can play magic over the Wallstones theory of uh, global inequalities. Fine. Uh, 
fine. Uh, now let's move on to the next thing. Uh, for example, uh, the question is difference and similarity between totemism and animism. So animism is uh, worship of supernatural power, and totems are your totems are uh, your uh, the symbolic representation of animals, plants, and natural elements. So this is a very static question. Uh, static answers are available for it. Um, this could be attempted easily. Now let's move on to the next part. The next question says that uh, examine the relevance of uh, CSR, corporate social responsibility, in a world uh, market. Uh, in a world marked by increasing environmental crisis. So, uh, what is corporate social responsibility? Now, corporate social responsibility is what it is the concept uh, that provides what? That talks about that every businesses, or for that matter, businesses should have the responsibility to contribute positively. society and in a world which is having an increasing environmental crisis uh, this should bring in what or this uh, CSR should uh, focus on building in environment and uh, how or it respect to what so you can talk about uh, you know uh, bringing in uh, certain practices that would help you in meeting pollution resource depletion ghgs greenhouse gases etc so one is your this then is uh, how climate change could be uh, you know controlled how resource conservation should be there, how uh, there should be risk management or risk management should be considered. So all this lies with respect to your uh, CSR. Uh, now let's move on to the next question. The 10 marks meant this much is enough. Uh, had it been 20 marks question, uh, you have to write enough with respect to sociologists. So uh, you can link this with uh, with, with sociologists and then write this. Uh, this is what uh, the question is about and what they are demanding from you, obviously. Now, Next one is that how civil society is useful in deepening the roots of democracy. So what you can do is that you can talk about the civil society's importance in strengthening democracy and uh, how is this going to happen. So, uh, you can talk about the uh, Robert Putnam. Robert Putnam has talked about what? Um, how uh, these civil society organizations, such as your NGOs, your NGOs, your associations, your community groups, how they facilitate uh, facilitate what social interaction? And cooperation among citizens. Uh, so social capital and your uh, trust will be maintained. So social capital. And trust could be maintained. So this is what Robert Putnam has talked about. Now uh, you can also talk about uh, political engagements. These civil societies help uh, people in doing what? Bringing political engagements. And by political engagement, what do I mean? Participation of civil society.
the next thing you can talk about uh, that sociologists had uh, advocated what um, that these civil society organizations are going to bring in uh, voice to specific communities such as the labor unions, human rights NGOs. environmental groups etc so you can say that they are uh, building in towards what a very responsive democracy fine uh, then uh, a lot of factors for example uh, these uh, civil societies are also going to bring you what a basic uh, amenity for example your education or health hospitals etc everything could be brought at your doorsteps and uh, in a participative democracy these are very important things so uh, health and health of uh, the democratic civil society will be taken care of Okay, so this was for this one. Now let's move on to the next one. What functions does religion uh, perform in a pluralistic society? So uh, again, uh, this is a very static portion. How? Uh, here you can uh, talk about all, for example, it is going to bring uh, <coughs> social cohesion. It is going to bring in uh, social identity. Fine. Uh, here you can uh, talk about the email kind. Email kind concept of uh, social integration. Email the kind concept of social integration by uh, bringing religion. So. The science concept of social integration uh, with respect to religion. Then uh, you can also talk about uh, coping with uh, uncertainty. For example, in Asiatic society, uh, Radha Krishnan has Dr. Radha Krishnan has already talked about uh, Asiatic societies were very prone to disaster. So in that case, uh, religion helps you to cope with uncertainty. Fine. Uh, next is uh, you can also talk about uh, social change, activism. How? Because the religion helps you to work towards what humanitarian causes. Uh, so all this and then uh, you can add up many factors for example dialogue, cooperation, uh, interfaith, uh, religions etc. So all this will act as that. Now let's move on to the next one that analyzes critically the David Morgan's view on family practices. So what has David Morgan talked about? So David Morgan has given certain perspectives with respect to family practices. For example, they have, uh, sorry, David Morgan has emphasized on what? Um, David Morgan has emphasized on cultural, historical, and social context of uh, family system. That means uh, uh, family practices. Very across cultures. Fine. Uh, then here uh, you can also talk about uh, how Morgan's view was, uh, uh, you know, um, was accepted by uh, Crenshaw. You can talk about Crenshaw. You can talk about Collins. And what they have uh, argued, they have argued that family experiences and practices help in uh, shaping the, you know, uh, uh, identity of a person. So uh, they have kind of uh, in favor with David Morgan's view. So they have talked about 
shaping of identity of person then you can also talk about partial now partial has given what now partial has talked about gender roles power dynamics etc <coughs> and uh, they have talked about what unpaid labor etc then at the same time you can talk about family and modernity so what was uh, uh, scholars like uh, giddens and beck have talked about what they have talked about processes of modernization and globalization modernization and globalization and how the practices of modernization and globalization affecting the traditional family structure i uh, you can also talk about uh, lgbt two families and here you can uh, you know talk about uh, sociologists uh, uh, like judith stacy you can talk about uh, timothys what they have given the uh, concept Uh, they have talked about in fact so i not give it but they have explored the concept of same sex couples etc fine uh, then you can talk about family system they uh, uh, you can also talk about uh, uh, criticality with respect to david morgan's view Um, in fact, uh, uh, most of them have uh, talked about uh, how uh, Murugan's view are uh, different with respect to theirs. For example, uh, LGBT two have families now; they are same-sex couples, etc. Right? Uh, then you should talk about does women's education help to eradicate patriarchal discrimination? Uh, here you can give. uh how the sociologist uh, shamila deje has uh, you know uh, given this concept of uh, um or how shamila's work has emphasized that uh, education would help in resisting oppressive practices and what are those example dowry uh restrictions on mobility etc then uh, you can talk about the work of amartya sen and uh, what has uh, amartya sen talked about for example education uh, will help in reducing uh wage gaps uh breaking cycle of poverty how uh, this will or how education will uh, challenge or bring economic independence to women uh, at the same time then you can talk about how education uh, is going to bring in political participation and this is talked uh, by or this is uh, all yeah anne philips has talked about it
fine um, then uh, you can also talk about uh, legal awareness that means education is going to bring in legal awareness with respect to uh, the women section so advocacy and awareness and this was highlighted by martha fennel martha fennel advocacy and legal measures or legal awareness Uh, yeah now let's move on to the next question uh, the next question talks about uh, different dimensions of qualitative method do you think that qualitative method helps to gain a deeper sociological insight again this is very static so any of your static mode would be helpful in covering this for example here you can talk about data collection method you can talk about uh, Goffman's work about participant observation. You can talk about uh, Boudou's work. Then you can talk about uh, Strauss work, document analysis, how Becker has talked about it. All, all th This is a very static question. Now, the next question talks about to explain Max Weber's theory of social stratification. Again, very, very uh, static portion, and this has been most of the time, uh, most of the test series have included this. How does Weber's idea of class differs from that Marx? So, here you are going to talk about Marx inside also and Weber's inside also. So, class, party status, you are going to talk about class, party status over here. Uh, with respect to Marx, what you are going to talk about? Class. Marx has mostly talked about class. So, you can uh, explain about bourgeois and proletariats, etc. So, this question can be dealt like that. Again, very static. So, what are the ethical issues that a researcher face? Again, this is very uh, static question. For example, uh, you can talk about here uh, what is going to happen. Now, uh, informed consent is there. For example, researcher must obtain an informed consent from participant <coughs> while, uh, you know, participant observation. Then uh, deception is there, privacy, confidentiality, everything. Privacy, all factors could be talked about here. Privacy, confidentiality. Then you can write about the views of Lario. Fine. Um, emotional impact also, Becker has talked about emotional impact also. <coughs> Fine. Uh, okay, so this could be dealt again, a very static one. Now, let's move on to the next question. Explain how economic globalization has brought changes in pattern of employment in the 21st century. See, uh, this is also, uh, you know, something which uh, the person has uh, worked on can uh, attend this question. Here you can talk about Richard Florida's concept of what creative class. And what is that creative class? This is, uh, they are talking about knowledgeable class. Okay, so there is uh, knowledge worker, knowledgeable workers are there who are doing what? They are driving your economic growth. So, Richard Florid, uh, Florida, then uh, you can also talk about Hoshel's work. And what is that Hoshel's work here? You can talk about emotional labor. Uh, then uh, you can uh, talk about um, a sociologist who have given the concept that economic globalization has uh, brought in change in the income uh, income changes. Like what kind of income changes? For example, gig economy, gig work, 
example your ola uber etc yeah ola uber etc fine then migration labor mobility etc uh, then uh, there was this sociologist thomas piketty now they have talked about what income inequality etc so very easy uh, a lot of intermixing but again uh, worth attending the question the second part of the question i found was uh, very static a, a little bit of mind and you can go through with this now do you think that social media has brought significant changes in the form of protest uh again see you can talk about many of the things for example you can talk about twitter facebook instagram whatsapp etc uh here you can talk about accessibility you can talk about uh, mobilization of uh, people you can talk about information dissemination fine uh then you can also talk about uh, global solidarity networking then uh, a lot of horizontal organizations also being formed then um, uh, here you can also talk about uh, hashtag movements what are those your hashtag movements for example like you remember there was this hashtag black lives matter right um, all these modern concepts can be easily linked in this question a very very nice question but at the same time you know you need to be very aware with this so modern concepts uh, with respect to what mobilizing troops etc <clears throat> civic engagement surveillance accountability etc fine <clears throat> everything could be added over here now the next question is assess the criticality uh, criticality yeah, critically age prime theory of development of under development now what you need to do is that you need to talk about uh, prime theory of uh, development of under development what is that now see theory of uh, this development of under development this has been uh, a very uh, subject a critical subject of debate why because uh, it emphasizes the role of capitalism it emphasizes the role of colonialism and uh, with respect to what with respect to perpetuating under development in which areas now development of under development so uh, perpetuating what perpetuating under development in post colonial countries fine now what you can do over here is uh, you can talk about uh, emmanuel wallstein's theory uh, you can talk about cardoso's theory you can talk about ribbish theory so i i'm just writing it out you can talk about wallstein's theory you can talk about ribbish Theory. Um, you can talk about Escobar. <coughs> then uh, you can uh, write about uh, world systems analysis. Everything, right? You can talk about uh, all of them here. Now the next question is: What is uh, terrorism? And uh, analyze the uh, merit now see what is terrorism terrorism uh, i tell you what it is it is uh, basically was introduced by terror and uh, the concept was applied scientific principles in the management of workers and task Right now, this is what this concept was given by uh, Frederick Taylor in the 20th century. So, uh, based on that, you can write about the merits and demerits. Again, very uh, easy question. Uh, a lot of analysis, and that's it. Uh, the next question is about new religious movements. Now, in this, what you can do is 
since they are talking about new religious movement, uh, one thing you can talk about here is that what was the need of these new religious movements. So you can talk about the cult section. Then uh, you can uh, give here spiritual movements, millennial movements, etc. Uh, millennial movement, cult section, you can also talk about spiritual movement. Okay, so all this will act as a part of your new religious movement and uh, regarding what, why is it important? See, right now we have done what um, in order to bring in the secular characteristic, in order to bring in the humanistic perspective, in order to conserve environment, all of this like a bundle of things you can include and there is uh, absolutely uh, no headache about it. Now um, the next question is examine the role of science and technology in addressing the age-old taboos and superstition. Now with respect uh, to various sociologists what you can do is that uh, you can talk about the education part. We have just done with respect to the feminist concepts. So you can talk about that. You can talk about literacy. You can uh, talk about Weber's idea of modernization. Here you can uh, give Weber's idea of modernization. Fine. Uh, you can talk about the medical advancement. You can uh, talk about uh, medical advancement, you can talk about media, you can talk about civic organization, and then uh, you can talk about urbanization, then you can also give uh, the relevance of uh, science programs and documentaries. etc. Fine. So uh, I think uh, this this part was uh, a bit uh, uh, conceptual oriented. So if your concepts are clear, then uh, the whole paper could have been attempted. Uh, though it was time taking, yes, no denial about it. It was time taking. Uh, but then uh, concept clarity was important for it. Okay. So thank you so much. I'll be doing the paper two analysis also soon. Thank you. Thank you.